listening to Everyday Engineering, the City of Madison's engineering podcast where we talk about infrastructure. Complex topics explained simply. From the water that flows down your drain to the rain and snow that drains into the lakes. By way, the curbs and streets we design. City engineering touches your life in so many ways. Explained right now in Everyday Engineering. We're all spending a lot of time in our yards, and a lot of people may be trying to cut cost by doing a lot of the work themselves. So we're here to help you. One, because we don't want you to create more issues for yourself from a stormwater perspective, and two, so you landscape without worry so that you truly are improving your yard, not only to beautify, but also to improve the environment. My name is Hannah Molinitsky, City of Madison Engineering Division Public Information Officer, joining me today to chat about a topic that impacts a lot of people. Phil Gabler, a stormwater engineer in the City of Madison Engineering Division. Thank you, Phil, for being here. Hi, Hannah. Hi. Let's talk about this topic because we hear questions about this all the time in all sorts of meetings. Um, This topic came up after hearing public questions and a number of field visits with residents. And I know I heard a lot of questions about landscaping and what people can do to help improve their lawns, but also to help the stormwater infrastructure. So I guess, what are you hearing from people when they ask about this? Because they want to know from the engineer. They want to know, what can I do that makes sense and will work? Right. So... We get a fair amount of questions about this, and sometimes you start with a really easy question, and then it spirals down, and all all of a sudden, there's a lot of questions being thrown at us at once. So if I went through this list, I get questions about, oh, I want to install a rain garden. How do I do that? Oh, I want to use natives. Do I need to be concerned about something? Hey, my yard's muddy, and my dog gets muddy. How do I fix this problem? (laughs) I have erosion in my yard. I have a wet basement. I have, when it rains, I get weird drainage between my lots. Mm -hmm. And then it doesn't seem like it would be related, but also occasionally sanitary backups, where someone will talk about a sanitary backup and you realize it might actually be tied to a poor landscaping decision in the past. Mm. So if we just to kind of address that last one, because it's a little outside today's scope, sometimes people will plant a tree right over where their sanitary sewer connects to the city sanitary main. Right. And those, if it's an old pipe, those roots will find the cracks in the pipe and work their way in. And next thing you know, you're calling rotor rooter all the time. And you want to avoid that. So if you're doing new landscaping, know where your sanitary lateral is. And especially if you're planting a tree with aggressive roots, don't plant it right on top of that, that sewer lateral. And I should say also, before you dig ever, dig um, call diggers hotline for safety reasons, but they're not going to be able to tell you the sewer line is are they they will they will be they know where that sewer lateral is okay and then also just so you know if you're listening um when we say sewer main that's the main pipe in the middle underground in the middle of say a typical road and then off of the main is a sewer um, lateral or a service line that stems out from the main into your home so just to give you some perspective on when we say lateral and then when we say main um that is sure something that is super common phil I want to plant a tree, I would never think that the, the, the tree roots would just kind of grow through, but that's actually quite common. It is. Yes. And there's many, many trees, especially if you, you know, most people don't choose a willow for their yard, but there's some places where there's willows around. Mm-hmm. They are notorious for really finding their way into a sanitary lateral. Mm-hmm. Especially if the lateral is old. Um, okay. So that's what we're hearing from people. That's yep, interesting. Which is a pretty good laundry list. Yeah, <laughs> there's a lot. I mean, there, you, you really don't think of that, but I hear the wet basement a lot, um, but we'll get to that in, in a second also. So, okay, a lot of people landscape for purpose to improve drainage. You kind of touched on this a little bit. So can this be done? Can you landscape in a way to help that? And if so, how? So I think there's a few things people can look at here. One, if you have a low spot in your yard, right, and it's getting muddy and your soils don't infiltrate water, let water soak into the ground really well, there's a few things you can do. Um, water moves best, right, if it is at, uh, has a slope on the land, right? So the kind of rule of thumb here is 2% slope. So that means over 100 feet, you're going to drop two feet down, right? Not a whole lot of drop, but that's enough that the water can move. If you go to a, a low spot that you're trying to drain and you want it just to raise it, you can 
run what's called a level line. And this is just a string and a little level that you can lock on the string. You can string that across your yard and then you can measure down. And it's really easy to tell the slope. You know, it's, it's a very inexpensive way to survey your lawn, yeah. which if you're a homeowner, you don't want to go out and buy a very, very expensive, you know, construction grade survey equipment. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so it is possible to landscape for purpose. It is. And also, if you have a place where water is draining, we oftentimes, you know, people might put things in the way of the drainage for aesthetics. A rock, you know, or a plant that is mounding up the soil a little bit. Be conscientious of how much water flows between your house and your neighbors and or away from the spot that you want drainage to occur. And, and don't put something big in the way. These but obstacles I, I, can really slow things down. I really wanted that plant there, though. I really wanted that really pretty plant there or that really pretty nice rock. Yes, but you also wanted a dry <laughs> basement. And life is full of trade-offs. Yeah. <laughs> and when you're talking about when water is flowing, that's like, you know, during a storm. Are we talking like during a storm or a, you know, a thunderstorm or a rainstorm or, or what have you? Like, And you can see the water flowing off your home. Is that what we're talking about? Right. And, okay. and this kind of gets to that wet basement aspect, right? If it... If someone is saying they get water in their basement, right? The best time to check this is when it's raining really, really heavy, mm -hmm. right? Look out your windows if you don't want to get wet. If you haven't been able to solve the problem just looking out your windows, it's time to get the umbrella out and go and watch the water that flows off of your property. See where it's going. See if it's pooling. There's lots of weak points in the system. You know, people might not have that 2% slope away from their foundation. You want to have that. Get the water five feet away from your foundation at least. Try to have that be the, the low point so it, and as it moves away. You might have window wells that, you know, are degraded and or mm -hmm. somebody's built up soil around it, and now that's the low point. Mm -hmm. You don't want water to pool on your basement windows. It's a bad idea. You know, also downspouts that clog and spill over, they can cause problems. And you could have a downspout that is, you know, the bottom fell off. I see that all the time. Yes. And doing that preventative maintenance when it's dry and then checking it when it's raining is a good way to solve a lot of the, these really easy problems that a couple screws, maybe a little bit of, a little bit of material, and you're going to have a dry basement. Like the extra metal chunk that like hooks onto the bottom of the downspout, right? Right. Because it sometimes falls off. I found that it on does. my house. Yes. Yeah. Um, and you're just kind of like, hey, that's not working how it should. And even sometimes that piece isn't even long enough. It should still kind of extend out. Correct. Okay. Um, and we, yeah, so this next question I had about the wet basement problem. So we kind of touched on all of that. So, um, you know, the idea that you can, is this a valid idea? I mean, people think that they can cure their wet basement problem and do something for the environment at the same time if you landscape appropriately. So um, in addition to the downspouts and anything like that, I mean, I guess what can we do? Is that even possible to landscape appropriately and how So to cure your wet basement? No one wants a wet basement. It's such a hot topic. People, I mean, there is nothing worse, especially if you redo your basement, especially if you're, you're just, you have an older basement. Last thing you want is a moldy, smelly basement, wet. Right. So I think as you were landscaping, you want to make sure you're not causing water to pool next to your foundation, right? Minimum, you want that water to, to slope. You want to have a slope away from your house, that minimum five feet, 10 feet is more ideal. Get the water away from your house, but that water still has value in your yard, right? And you can do a lot of good things. And that water carries nutrients and erosion and sediment. Oh, it has the power to do that. You can slow that down further away from your house, mm -hmm. When you're thinking about landscaping to fix a wet basement, think getting water away from the foundation, making sure you don't have pooling against it. Then, once that water is kind of away from your house in the right direction, mm -hmm. then you can think about adding places for it to soak back into the ground, mm -hmm. where it's not going to raise the groundwater table or have a mound of groundwater that will then push against your foundation with water that will seep back in. These are good things, news you can use, information you can use. That's what this podcast is all about. We want this information to be useful for people when they're listening all in 20 minutes. Um, anything else on the wet basement topic? Well, I, think, I think the wet basement is good. Having a sump pump is a really nice insurance policy, right? <laughs> uh, 
a lot of people put them in in 2018 or after 2018. Mm -hmm. And I think that some pump can can give you a nice safety factor if you do have a situation where one of your part of your drain system fails. You get some temporary water that's going to get in your basement. The sump pump will take that and put it outside. Mm -hmm. I think routing that sump pump to the right spot is important, right? If you just dump it right next to your foundation, you're just going to pump the same water over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. You want to get it, again, away to the spot where you're going to manage your water. Now, my favorite way to manage this water on site is to install a rain garden. And if you have that at least 10 feet from your house and you design it right, the plants can handle all this extra water. It can soak back in the ground, kind of net impact on the city's storm sewer system and the ability for that system to transport pollutants into the lake is essentially balanced, right? You, you move the water away from your foundation, dry basement, you soak it into the ground, you're watering native plants that have deep roots and are providing habitat for a lot of our insects and pollinators in the city. And that is all explained in a different podcast episode, Rain, Rain, Go in My Garden. Check that out also on this engineering podcast. So yes, let's talk more rain gardens in a minute. Love that. Also win winning all around by trying to get rid of your wet basement or improving that situation, pulling the water away and having it soak in. Okay, so there are a lot of stormwater impacts of landscaping, probably something we wouldn't necessarily think about in the initial charge of trying to beautify our lawns, but let's break down a few of these. So first things up, uh, grass clippings and yard waste. You know, talk to us about that and maybe some things of what people should not do. All right, so if you look at where uh, kind of nutrients are in our city, right? Mm -hmm. A sidewalk does not produce a lot of nutrients. It's concrete. Right. However, the grass that's next to that concrete is a living thing. And when you cut it, right, it has phosphorus and it has nitrogen and other nutrients in there. And our lawnmowers are designed to shoot stuff out the side or put it into a bag, right, or just to mulch it. As you're doing this, some of it gets onto that concrete. Now that concrete, when it rains just a tiny bit, that water will take the nutrients from the grass clippings and move it into our system. And then that is essentially a water slide directly into the lake. Mm. So nutrients get into the road, they're in the lake. And we don't want that. We don't want that. That nutrient then becomes food for algae. And if you've been around the lakes this uh, this early summer, they're a little on the sneaky side. Yeah. And it's nice to avoid that, right? right. Let's help them out. Yes. Okay. So what people can do is after they're done mowing, it might feel a little meticulous, but you can get out the old push broom and just push those clippings right back onto your grass. And then when it rains on them, right, the little bit of water will take those nutrients and put it back into the soil, become food for your grass, and you'll have a healthier lawn. Keep your gla- grass clippings. Keep them. Yep. Push them right back onto that grass. Hoard them. Hoard mm-hmm. your grass clippings. Okay, next up, rain garden. So we talked a little bit about this. Your rain garden alone, your rain garden alone, Phil, soaks up a nice amount of storm water off of your roof. What do people need to know? Also, what should they not do? So I think with rain gardens, the big thing, there's, we did a whole episode on rain gardens, right? right? right. And go listen to that. There's tons of great resources on ripple effects in the City of Madison website. I think with rain gardens, the big thing from a drainage perspective is make sure you think about how water will get there and where water will leave if it gets overwhelmed so you don't end up creating a a drainage problem with your landscaping where you're, you're getting water back into your basement, right? 10 feet away from your foundation, an overflow that spills out towards the street that is not going to go into your neighbor's window. You know, be courteous. You have to think through this design process. It's a fair amount of work. There's a lot of resources out there to help people. Mm-hmm. Rain gardens do a great job of capturing those small storms and letting them soak into the ground and providing that uh, native plant habitat. So a big pay, a big thing to note on rain gardens is location, location, location where you're putting it. Don't put it so close to your home. Correct. Ten feet, good rule of thumb. Okay, healthy soil, healthy plants, healthy lakes. What does this mean to have healthy soil? So when you look <laughs> at what some people will call soil, right, in a in a <laughs> suburban or a uh, an urban environment, mm-hmm. it, it's oftentimes closer just to dirt, right? It's it's pretty dead. It's been compacted. It has been abused. It's not in the best shape. And by that, I mean, 
soil, when, when you think about soil, right, it has air in it, it has organic matter in it, and it has different particles of, of the actual soil, right? And those work together to hold water when it rains, provide, you know, nutrients for the roots and the plants and all these things. But when you compact it really, really hard, it can, it can really not function the way that you want, right? It almost functions more like concrete. If you mm -hmm. compact soil when it's wet, all the air is gone. And so it takes a long time for that soil to recover from this type of compaction. And that can be construction that you've done for a deck with a skid steer, or it can be if you're in a, a newer subdivision, when they came in, stripped off all the topsoil, put back six inches, drove bulldozers everywhere, that soil is beat up. Right. So there's a few things you need to do in order to bring the health back, right? One of my favorite recommendations is to use some compost, right? You get organic matter, you get the bacteria and the things that help break down mm -hmm. your grass clippings as you leave them on your lawn and brush them off of your sidewalk. And hoard them. Hoard them. <laughs> and another great tool to do if you're, if you're working in a lawn and you, you haven't done much work, mm -hmm. taking soil samples and sending them to the UW Soil Lab, mm -hmm. they will run chemical analysis on this and tell you what your soil has and what they recommend adding to it. It might say, you have almost no organic compound or content. Mm -hmm. Add some compost. It might say, you have no nitrogen, right? And I am not a huge advocate of adding all these extra fertilizers to your lawn, mm -hmm. but there are times when it's necessary in order to make that grass be healthy. And if you are going to have a lawn, it is beneficial to have a healthy lawn. We just don't want a lawn that is is kind of on steroids, right? Mm -hmm. If you look at your lawn and you're like, you know, this is a spray tan and a, a bikini away <laughs> from a, a competition, your lawn is, is probably over fertilized and maybe over watered. You, you want a, a lean, like runner build lawn. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I definitely, yes. And I know what you're getting at because we want it to be healthy. We don't want it to be um, too much. Right. We don't want it to be too much. We don't want it to be too much. Yes, let's and just so say that. <laughs> in Dane County, there is actually a rule that you cannot apply phosphorus to your lawn mm -hmm. unless you're just getting it established, right? So we have you can you can nurture a, a young lawn and if you go and get a soil test and the soil lab tells you that your soil is deficient in phosphorus, only then can you apply phosphorus fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And I think you know, follow that rule. It's very, very beneficial to our lakes because when you over phosphor, when you put more phosphorus down than the plants can uptake, it stays in the soil. And then every little bit of erosion that you have out of your lawn mm -hmm. and even some of the water that just flows off takes that phosphorus right past your, right past your grass and into the lake where it becomes food for algae. I smell a soil episode. Okay. Lawn chemicals. We have about three minutes. Lawn chemicals and fertilizers. What do people need to know, Phil? So, first off, right, a lot of the lawns, a lot of lawn herbicides are broadleaf selective herbicides, right? They leave the grass, mm -hmm. kill everything with a flat leaf, right? Those are slightly toxic to aquatic organisms. Most of them are. And I think a good rule of thumb to follow is. You know, follow the directions. Diligently follow the direction. This is not the time to be a cowboy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Protect yourself, right? Put on your your personal protective gear, right? It's important. Mm -hmm. You know, don't say, oh, well, it's not that bad or they wouldn't sell it over the counter. No, the directions say, we can sell this over the counter because we're telling you to wear gloves. Mm -hmm. Some of them wear a face mask. Some of them wear goggles. Sure. Follow those rules. And last, like, use as little as possible. If you are not someone who needs to have a perfect monotype lawn of only bluegrass or only grass, and you can tolerate a few weeds, consider not using those herbicides, because even though their impact is small, there is still an impact. Mm -hmm. uh, we talk about salt. We also have a whole episode on salt, um, just a quick little um, part on salt. Just um, You can just share a little bit on that, because as we're wrapping up. So... In the winter, many of our, uh, the residents in Madison and our professional winter maintenance uh, crews out there are using sodium chloride or salt, 
to get rid of ice in the winter. Now, the sodium portion of that has pretty detrimental impacts on the soil next to the, the sidewalk, right? Mm -hmm. You'll, you see in the, in the spring, a lot of places where they've applied a lot of salt, you have a nice dead strip of grass there. Mm -hmm. And then you have, you know, you have to do repairs, it's a lot of work. Maybe this is a case where the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, where if we just use the right amount of salt and spend a little more time on mechanical remover, removal, right? That same brush you're using to sweep your grass clippings off of your sidewalk, you can use that as a finishing broom and have your sidewalk be almost completely free of ice, never having to use any salt. There are times when you need to use a little bit because we have a nice storm or tough conditions. If you go to Wisconsin SaltWise, you can get recommendations on how much to put down. Following those guidelines will get you well on the way to protecting both your landscaping from salt and uh, you know, protecting our waters because the chloride is accumulated in our lakes and we don't want that. Uh, last question for you, other than the resources, uh, say we don't want to do it ourselves. <laughs> Say we want to hire somebody. And I we hear this a lot when we're meeting with um, residents in the field. I've heard this a lot. You know, I hired a, you know, a private landscaper to do this to help with my drainage. And is this a good idea? What should people know when they do this, if they do this? Yeah, so I think the private landscaping community is great at solving these problems, right? They They have resources, they have tools, they have equipment, and they can help to create a aesthetically pleasing landscape that also drains properly. As a homeowner, especially if you're having them come in and do maintenance after the fact, mm -hmm. I think you should make your desires clear. Are you willing to have some herbicides put on your lawn? Make sure that they're not putting down phosphorus fertilizer if it's not needed. Granted, they're, they're following the rules, they're, they're bound to those rules as well, but a reminder sometimes goes a long way. Mm -hmm. um, also, if they're doing your leaf management and mowing your lawn, Make sure that the grass clippings, and especially the leaves, are out of the street when they're done with the job, right? Mm -hmm. If they're leaf-blowing leaves out into the street or blowing grass clippings out into the street, it's time to have a conversation with that contractor and remind them you'd like to have those left on the lawn. Okay, is it a good idea to hire somebody for this private landscaping to help with drainage? Maybe you have a wet basement. Is that a good idea? I, th I think it... Uh, at a start, it is. You may need to get into kind of a wet basement specialist. Mm -hmm. You know, some wet basement problems cannot be solved with landscaping, right? Sometimes you need to have a sump pump or some sort of drainage because you, you are You waited until the end of the episode to tell me this? Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes, oh. sometimes the, the problem <laughs> is a little more extensive than just sure. surface water flowing down. It's... It's every, it's the whole landscape around you. Your house may have been built a little bit too low and we have seen groundwater levels rising in the last few years because we've had so much rain. Mm -hmm. Now this year, they're probably dropping down a little bit more, but it's sometimes you get past landscaping to solve your problem and you need to do a more extensive fix. Mm -hmm. I think then talk with your contractor you have. If it is not in their wheelhouse, see if they can recommend somebody. They want you to have success. Mm -hmm. So work with them. This this community of landscapers and basement uh, repair folks, they're well-versed in this, a lot of expertise. They can help you find a solution. As always, shop around, get three quotes. Mm -hmm. You'll be happier that you did. So much happier. Thank you for your expertise, Phil. So so much help, so much information and very helpful. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Um, if you have a further question or you want to have us tackle a different topic, just write to us on our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, City of Madison Engineering, because we are here for you always, every day in engineering. <laughs>